Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the previous track, we were talking about the Gahin and the Araf. We defined what they mean and we gave the ruling on going to them and asking them about things and believing in them. The soothsayers or the fortune tellers may well say things which are correct, as they have heard it from their jinn who work for them. Now, these soothsayers were many during the time of the Prophet and they would make incredible predictions of the future and people would believe in them because of that. Before the Prophet was sent, the jinn would steal the hearing from the decree in the heavens and deliver it to the soothsayer. Of course Allah Jalla wa ala allowed this to happen. Why? Well, because he allows many sins and transgressions to take place as a test for his servants. If there was no temptation, there would be no test. Then during the revelation of the Qur'an, so this would be when the Prophet became a Prophet and the Qur'an was now being sent down, Allah Jalla wa ala did not allow the jinn to steal the hearing from the heavens because of the revelation of the Qur'an. In Surah Al-Jinn, we find وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ فَوَجَدَنَاهَا مُلِئَتْ حَرَسًا شَدِيدًا وَشُهُبًا And we have reached the heavens, but we found it filled with strict guards and shooting stars. And this is so that the jinn could not steal any of the wahi or the revelation. So if that were to happen, they may deliver it to one of the soothsayers and the soothsayers start to recite the Qur'an. And then people start thinking, oh look, they are the prophets. And then what about the period after the prophet? Are the heavens now still filled with these gods and shooting stars? Well, what is apparent is that they are still filled with these things and are protected so that no one else may claim prophethood and start predicting the future. And when it comes true, he is able to now mislead the people. So anyone claiming knowledge of the unseen clearly is contradicting the Qur'an and that is kufr. Or he may be seeking help with the jinn by worshipping them. And so the jinn are able to perform extraordinary feats for him. Okay, here's a question. What about going to them and asking them for the sake of exposing them as frauds? Well here, if one has sufficient knowledge, this can be allowed. Because the Prophet himself did this with Ibn Sayyad, who was a young boy at that time and would predict the future. And so the Prophet told him, what am I thinking of? And the boy said, ad And the Prophet was actually thinking of ad which means smoke. And the Prophet told him, be you rejected, you cannot overstep your limits. So in order to expose them, if one has the knowledge and the Iman, then a case can be made that it is permissible to do so. Otherwise, just going to them and even asking them about something, not necessarily believing in them, but simply asking them, would render 40 nights of your prayer to be fruitless. Here's another question. How do these people tell the future or speak about matters of the unseen? What's their methodology? Well, these could be various. Some may do it by throwing stones or making lines on the sand. But of course, these are not means by which you tell the future. So drawing lines on the sand is not a means by which to tell the future. So if somebody does tell the future and is employing jinn, then he will know the future by way of the jinn who have stolen the herring. And these lines are simply just a show to impress the people or to intrigue them. The Prophet in Sahih Muslim tells us that there was a Prophet who would tell the future by drawing lines. He says, There used to be a Prophet who used to draw lines and tell about the future or unseen. So whoever does that and his lines agree with the future, then that is that. This hadith does not mean to say that it is permissible to draw lines, but it is to say that if your lines are in accordance with the future, then so be it, you have told the future. But the point is, even before that, that no one can tell the future simply by drawing lines on the ground or on the sand. Rather, that was an ayah or a sign of prophethood, and no one is able to imitate the signs which a prophet has been given. The signs of the prophets are exclusively for them. They cannot be imitated. Just like, for example, the Qur'an cannot be imitated. It is a sign for the last prophet. And likewise, every prophet has had signs which cannot be imitated. So it's a bit like saying, if you can reproduce the like of the Qur'an, then that is that. You have met the challenge. But of course, we know that cannot be done. Because like we said, signs of the prophets are specific to them. Okay, what about the earning of the Qur'an? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Hulwanul kahin khabith. A gift given to a kahin is khabith, it's impure. 
and in al-Bukhari it is narrated that a boy came to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and gave him some food which Abu Bakr subsequently ate and then the boy said do you know where I obtained this food from Abu Bakr said no and he said that in the days of Jahiliya I used to do kahana for the people which is soothsaying and one of my customers gave me this gift Meaning this food is a gift and so Abu Bakr put his finger inside his throat and made himself vomit out this food so we find that the mu'min has to reject and rebuke those who take a gift for such evil practices and it is obligatory to enjoy the good and forbid the evil and we also read that the shaykh said that we do not believe anyone who claims that which contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma' and you'll notice he has said this immediately after mentioning the Quran and the Arrafin and this is because with the matter of the Quran or the Arrafun people may well be aware of their situation that the Kahana fortune telling is from Kufr outright however you may find other people who are outwardly righteous who do not claim to be fortune tellers yet they are still making claims about the unseen only they are sugarcoating it with Islamic talk or giving it an Islamic facade some may claim knowledge of the unseen not because they are Kohan but because they may claim that they are so righteous and pious that certain knowledge of the unseen has been revealed to them by Allah and all of that are lies because Allah Jalla wa ala only reveals the unseen to his messengers be it the messengers from the Malaika or messengers from the mankind we did mention before that from the Karama is that a Wali of Allah could come to know about things he ought not to know about and we gave the example of Umar radiallahu an giving the khutbah and it became known to him that his army detachment would be in danger and he shouted out oh detachment stick to the mountain stick to the mountain as if he could see them they were in the land of the Persians so many many miles away so this was a kashf or an unveiling to Umar radiallahu an this was a karama but it was not knowledge of the future it was also a karama for the army detachment as they heard the voice of Umar. Then the Shaykh goes on to say, وَنَرَ الْجَمَاعَةَ حَقًّا وَصَوَابًا And we have the opinion that the jama'a, the congregation, is the truth and upon the correct way. And he goes on to say, وَالْفُرْقَةَ زَيْغًا وَعَذَابًا And that people being disunited, this is زَيْغْ meaning deviancy and عَذَاب meaning punishment. The first question to ask is why did the Shaykh mention this? In an Aqeedah treatise, well firstly, all the deviancy in the Aqeedah, as well as fighting and bloodshed and bid'ah, ah, all of this happens due to leaving the Jama'ah and forming your own sect or seeing division as a good thing. So without a doubt, leaving the Jama'ah has an effect on the Aqeedah, amongst other things. Secondly, when the Prophet spoke about the 73 sects and 72 in the fire and one in Jannah, he said that the Jama'ah is the one in Jannah. So from our beliefs is that we oppose all the deviant sects who have broken off from the way of the companions. Let's take some talking points. As far as evidence is concerned, then there is a hadith in the hadith collection Zawa'idul Musnad in which the Prophet ﷺ said Al-Jama'atu Rahmah wal furqatu Adhab The congregation is a rahma and Spitting up into different groups is an adab, is a punishment on this ummah. Also in the Sahih, Man ataakum wa amrukum jami'un ala rajulin wahid yuridu an yashukka asakum faqtuluhu kainan man kan. Whoever comes to you and your matter is one and united under one ruler and this person wants to break or shatter your stick, meaning to say disunite you, then kill him, whoever he may be. And as far as the saved group is concerned, the Prophet said, He al Jama'a, it is the Jama'a. The Jama'a at that time would have been the Sahaba. Who else could it have been? And in another narration or wording, he said, He ma kana ala mithli ma ana alihi al yawm wa ashabi. They are the ones who are upon what I and my companions are upon today. We find in the Quran, Wa tasimu bi habilillahi jami'un wa la tafarraku and hold fast to the rope of Allah and do not be divided so this is the deen of Allah because it is with the rope where you climb upwards so it is the rope of Allah by which you gain nearness to Allah Jalla wa ala. 
As for the jama'ah, then we may understand it in two ways. Jama'ah fi deen, and this is what the Prophet and the companions were upon. So upon that then, one person may well be the jama'ah if everyone else is upon bid'ah. And this is because Allah Jalla wa'ala has revealed the sharia to us so that we may be united upon it, not disunited. So whoever disunites from it, then he is not from the jama'ah. So if only one person is following the sharia and the authentic sunnah, the others are following bid'ah, then they are from the furqa, and the one person is from the jama'ah. Allah Jalla wa'ala says, An aqimu ad-deena wa la tatafarraqu fi That you establish the deen and be not divided therein. Likewise, wa'atasimu bi hablillahi jami'an wa la tafarraqu So this type of jama'ah is that you enter into Islam totally in all aspects of your life. And not just have iman in some parts of the book, but you refuse to have iman and follow other parts of the book. This is the sunnah of the Yahud and Nasara. And then secondly, we have the jama'atul abdan, the jama'ah of the physical bodies. This is when you are all united under one ruler. Whoever this ruler may be, evil or righteous, and that you do not seek to revolt against this ruler. The Prophet ﷺ said about the evil rulers, Isma' wa ati' walaw dharaba dhaharak wa akhadha malak Isma' wa ati' Listen and obey even if he beats your back and takes your money. Listen and obey. Now the interesting point here is that both of these two types of jama'ah are linked so that if you have an infringement in the first type of jama'ah which is the jama'at al-deen then this will lead to an infringement in the jama'at al-abdan so when people start to deviate away from the sunnah and so that is an infringement in the first type of jama'ah this leads to breaking off into different groups and sects and that of course would be an infringement in the second type of jama'ah and the same thing works the other way around as well. So both of these two types of jama'ah are linked. So when we take a look at the various different groups today and how the ummah is so disunited, then the way we are going to get back to being united is by first of all fixing up the ijtima'ah in the deen. Once that happens, we will see physical uniting as well under one ruler. And it is to be noted that we must not go to extremes like the khawarij have done who have broken off from the jama'ah in pursuit of their dini goals, which is to remove the ruler if they feel he is not ruling by what Allah Jalla wa'ala has revealed. And so even if this means breaking up the ummah and causing fitna, so be it. And clearly this is a misguided ideology. These people first appeared during the time of Uthman, عن, which eventually led to his killing. And from there the floodgates of fitna broke. And on the other extreme, we have those who say that we do not need to enjoy the good and forbid the evil. Let everyone come together and be united physically, but at the same time, let everyone do whatever they want to. So they want the ishtima' in the body, yet no ishtima' in the deen. And this is also an extreme position to hold. Rather, the correct position is the third one, which is the one in the middle. They do not compromise on enjoining the good and forbidding the evil because through enjoining the good and forbidding the evil we will have unity where everyone holds on to the rope of Allah. But at the same time we call to being united even if it is under an evil ruler. So we would not go to extremes like the khawarij would do. Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah said that if the one enjoining the good or forbidding the evil sees that there will be a greater evil which results then it is not permissible for him to enjoy the good and forbid the evil. He says he would be a sinner in that case. And this is obvious because the Sharia came to secure the benefits for people and to make life better and more livable, not worse, and to reduce the corruption as much as is possible. So you see that the Khawarij, they do not care about what results from their actions. They go to extremes and even if it means revolting and bloodshed, then so be it. So at this point one may ask, if that is the case, then surely our conclusion is that a balance needs to be struck between the ijtima' of the deen and ijtima' of the abdan. And the answer to that is yes, this is exactly the middle way and the righteous way. And this is the way that the scholars seek to pursue. It is a delicate situation requiring deep and firm knowledge as well as wisdom. As it is clear for us to see that the Khawarij went wrong because they did not strike this essential balance, as they are not people of deep knowledge nor wisdom. Okay, now let us talk about the Furqa, which is the opposite of Jama'ah, when everyone is divided. 
Furqa is now also of two types, Furqa to Deen and Furqa Al-Abdan, the Furqa in the Deen and the Furqa in the physical body. So how did the Furqa or the splitting off from the Jama'ah come about? Well firstly, innovation of the Kufr type. So we're speaking about making the art to the dead, astrology and such types. Then we also have the Bid'a which are not Kufr, but nevertheless they are evil and less than kufr so for example one of the khawarij and the murji'a the qadariya jabriya and so on now these two types of causes for the furqa are blameworthy then we also have furqa in terms of the fiqhi issues about which there is a difference so issues pertaining to the tahara salah zakah siyam hajj and so on the default ruling or the asal about furqa is that it is blameworthy Allah Jalla wa ala says in Surah Hud, وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ And they will not cease to differ except those on whom your Rabb has mercy on. Differences in fiqhi matters is not blameworthy. We can all live with each other with differences in fiqhi matters. The Sahaba themselves had differences of opinion, but that did not lead to the unity being shattered. The Yahud before us disunited and went astray that way. Allah Jalla wa ala says, فَأَغْرَيْنَا بَيْنَهُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ And we enticed between them enmity and hatred. And this is because they broke their covenant with Allah Jalla wa ala and their hearts were hardened and they changed the words of their scripture from their right places and they forgot much of what they were reminded. So we know that Allah Jalla wa ala will forgive this scholar if he makes a mistake as long as he was sincere in seeking the truth. And as for the followers who are following the scholar out of trust, not knowing or realizing that it is the wrong opinion they are following, then they are also excused. However, it is still remains an obligation upon us to seek the truth. And those differing from you in fiqhi matters should be excused as long as they are trying to seek the truth or they are following their scholar out of trust. But what you see often happening is that whenever someone disagrees with a person, you find him abusing the other who disagrees with him or breaking off brotherly ties with him. And no doubt this is a blameworthy action. And about these matters of difference of opinion, of course all opinions cannot be correct. One opinion must be correct and the other ones must be false. But this is a matter of ishtihad of course. In these types of masail, if you feel that the sunnah is on your side, then take your guidance from Al-Imam Malik rahimahullah, who was asked, a person has the sunnah on his side. Should he argue on behalf of the sunnah? The Imam said, لا يخبر بالسنة فإن قبلت منه وإلا سكت. He says, no, he should not argue and debate defending the Sunnah. Rather, all he should do is that he should inform the people what the Sunnah is. Then if it is accepted from him, then that's all well and good. Otherwise, he keeps quiet. So he said, you do not argue and debate the Sunnah. You simply inform what the sunnah is, with its evidence of course, and if you have to refute other opinions with their evidences, then you do so with tranquility and in a dignified manner, and you need not do anything more. Because when you start to get into debates, then this opens the door to shaitan, and he incites you to score ego points over the other. So this debate now becomes an ego point type of contest, where you try to score points over the other and try to beat the other person as if it was some sort of boxing match. So what happens is that you're using the deen of Allah to stroke your own ego. And that is exactly what shaitan would want, as it will sow enmity and discord between the Muslims. So the point is that we respect differences of opinion. However, it is worth noting here that not every difference is to be respected. We need to look at the evidences upon which they are based. Because sometimes you can have some genuinely good differences of opinion, which are hard to call. Some of them are nearly impossible to call. A strong difference of opinion is one in which there is a difference in how the evidence is understood and there is nothing to tell us which is the weightier way to understand the evidence. A weak difference of opinion is an opinion which outright opposes a clear evidence or it is an opinion in which an authentic evidence has been grossly misunderstood. Now matters of khilaf, difference of opinion, are not the same as matters of ishtihad. Matters of ishtihad is like when a situation befalls us which did not befall a nation before us. So it's a new matter, a contemporary issue let's say. And we do not have any direct textual evidence for this contemporary issue. And so the scholars are going to make ishtihad. 
They may try to make an analogy with a ruling which is already established. So for example, this new contemporary issue is similar to a particular issue from the past. So it's analogous. So they may make an analogy. Now this analogy of theirs may differ. And there is no rebuking the issues of ishtihad. The scholar tried to arrive at the truth, and so he cannot be rebuked. However, matters of differences of opinion about which there is text, then this can be a strong difference of opinion, and we mention what that is. It is when the scholars understand the evidences in a different way, and there is no way for us to tell which is the weightier understanding. And then we can have a weak difference of opinion, in which a particular opinion completely opposes a clear-cut text, or there is a gross misunderstanding about a clear-cut text. A weak difference of opinion may be, for example, listening to music. Ibn Hazm is of the opinion that music is halal, and he deemed the hadith in al-Bukhari to be weak, about the ummah making musical instruments, wearing silk and khamar and zina halal. But this is an extremely weak difference of opinion. There is no way that that hadith in al-Bukhari is da'if, and the matter has been discussed in detail by the muhaddithin, but the point is that this is a very, very weak opinion. No blame on Ibn Hazm. He tried to arrive at the truth, but the blame is upon those who follow their desires, and they use Ibn Hazm rahimahullah as a smokescreen to justify their desires. They are the blameworthy ones. So we say about matters of fiqh and differences of opinion, and we're talking about valid differences of opinion, is that the more open-minded you are, the higher your chance of attaining the truth. And this is something which we have noticed and seen. Is it possible for the Prophet to make mistakes in matters of the deen? Well, no, the Prophet would not make mistakes in matters of the deen, so in terms of aqidah and fiqh and so on, but it was still possible for the Prophet to make mistakes outside the matters of the deen. The Prophet may deal with people and make a mistake. So we have in the Sahih Muslim, Aisha reports that the Prophet cursed and reviled two men. And Aisha told the Prophet, Goodness can reach everyone except it will not reach these two. And the Prophet asked, وَمَاذَاكْ Why is that so? And Aisha said, That you cursed them and reviled them both. The Prophet replied, أَوَمَا عَلِمْتِ مَا شَارَطْتُ عَلَيْهِ رَبِّي Did you not know what condition I stipulated with my Rabb? قُلْتُ اللَّهُمَّ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرْ فَأَيُّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ لَعَنْتُهُ أَوْ سَبَبْتُهُ فَجَعَلْهُ لَهُ زَكَاةً وَأَجْرَ he said, O oh Allah, I am only a man. So if I have cursed or reviled any of the Muslimin, then make that for him a purification and a reward. The point is that everyone can make mistakes. So we have to be mindful of that. And in matters of knowledge, you must seek to help the Sunnah. Because Allah Jalla wa ala helps those who help his cause. وَلَا يَنْصُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُ but Allah Jalla wa ala does not help the one who is helping his own ego. So trying to score ego points. Then the Shaykh changes the topic. He says, وَدِينُ اللَّهِ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاءِ وَاحِدٍ The deen of Allah in the earth and in the heavens is one and the same. وَهُوَ الدِّينُ الْإِسْلَامِ It is the deen of Al-Islam. قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الْإِسْلَامِ As Allah Ta'ala says, the deen with Allah is Islam. وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I am content with Islam as your deen. So the first point to note about this is what the Shaykh intends with the word Islam is the general meaning of the word Islam, which is to submit or surrender to Allah Jalla wa ala with Tawheed and obedience and to be free of shirk and its people. This is the Islam which every single prophet and messenger came with and there is no difference on that front. What the Shaykh is not talking about here is the particular Sharia of Muhammad because the Sharia are different from the Prophets to Prophets. Allah Jalla wa Ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah وَلِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شَرَعَةً وَمِنْ هَاجَةً And for everyone we have made a particular Sharia and a method to follow. We also take from his words that Islam is the only deen revealed from above the heavens. So anyone who says that Christianity or Judaism are heavenly religions, meaning they came down from above, then this is a mistake. Only Islam has been the heavenly deen, or one coming from above the heavens. Anyone following the prophets and obeying Allah has been a Muslim ever since the dawn of mankind. 
الله جل وعلا says هو سماكم المسلمين من قبل وفي هذا he has named you Muslimin from before and in this Quran as well إبراهيم عليه السلام and إسماعيل عليه السلام said ربنا وجعلنا مسلمين لك ومن ذريتنا أمة مسلمة لك وأرنا مناسكنا وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم أو الله make us مسلمين to you and from our offspring also make a Muslim nation meaning submitting to you here's an important question what does deen mean deen means كل ما يلتزم به everything which you adhere to so upon this definition a deen does not need to have a fancy name like Buddhism Hinduism or any other ism that's out there it does not need a fancy name anything which you adhere to your lifestyle this is your deen and it is also worth noting that the words deen, aqidah and sharia can be used interchangeably because there is much overlap. So matters of your aqidah, which is what we are talking about in this treatise, this is part of your sharia. Okay, so Islam means to surrender or to submit. Now this submission can be divided into three categories. Islam al-wajh, Islam al-amal and Islam al-qalb. So the first one is Islam al-wajh, surrendering the face. What this means to say is that you direct your abada to Allah only. So it's like you're facing Allah when you are worshipping. We are not just talking about the salah here. We're talking about all acts of worship. You are facing Allah, meaning you are directing these abadat to Allah Jalla wa'ala. In Surah Al-Baqarah we read, Bala man aslama wajhahu lillahi wa huwa muhsin. Nay, the one who submits his face to Allah and he is a good doer. He directs his worship to Allah Jalla wa'ala, not to anyone else. Secondly, we have the Islam al-Amal, the Islam of the actions, and this is where you have submitted yourself to Allah in your actions. So instead of performing actions in accordance with your desires, you do so in accordance with what Allah has ordered. Thirdly, we have the Islam al-Qalb, the Islam of the heart, and this is the root of the matter. It is that your heart submits to Allah Jalla wa'ala. So this matter pertains to your ikhlas when you do your actions seeking the pleasure of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Your Islam can also be divided into two separate categories, Islam Kamil and Islam Naqis. The Islam Kamil is the perfected Islam and Islam Naqis is the deficient Islam. So we basically say that your level of Islam fluctuates in accordance with how much you submit and surrender. And this is something which we can witness. So there is no doubt that Islam is something to be happy about and to be joyous about. What about being boastful? It is permissible to be boastful or to brag on three occasions. Number one, when you make mention of the ni'mah of Allah Jalla wa'ala that he has bestowed upon you. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ So you speak about the ni'mah of Allah Jalla wa'ala which he has bestowed upon you. So this type of being joyous is positive. Because ultimately you're not giving credit to yourself, so you're not stroking your own ego, rather you're giving credit to Allah Jalla wa'ala. Secondly, you can speak highly of your own credentials in order to make people follow you, if indeed you are worthy to be followed. So you have the knowledge, the experience to be followed, and you have more credentials than the others. Ibn Mas'ud said that there is not an ayah sent down except that he knows when and where it was revealed and if there is anyone who knows more than him and that it is possible to ride to such a person he would ride so clearly he is giving himself credit but this is with due right because firstly he is not lying he is actually qualified and then secondly to learn from him is more trustworthy than to learn from someone else who may not be as qualified Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said something similar when Allah Jalla wa'ala says about the people of the cave no one knows how many they were except a few people and Ibn Abbas says I am one of those few so this is not being prideful rather this is confidence and it is genuine confidence not a fake type of confidence the type of confidence when you can actually back up your statements and your claims so you can actually walk the walk Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah praises his own work in the poem of an because he is confident that his poem is one of the best pieces of work out there. This is a person who has encompassed the matters 
that he is speaking about. He's studied it from all sides and he's brimful of confidence. It's not pride or arrogance because you can actually back up your claims. Let us quote to you what he says. After having talked about the different madhahib and their batil aqidah, he says the following. هذه مقالات الطوائف كلها حملت إليك رخيصة الأثمان. These are the opinions of all of the different groups brought over to you cheaply. وأظن لو فتشت كتب الناس ما ألفيتها أبدا بذات بياني. And I do not think that even if you were to inspect all of the books of the people. You would find this information delivered with such clarity. زفت إليك فإن يكن لك ناظر أبصرت ذات الحسن والإحسان. Brought to you, and if you take a look, you would see it to be full of beauty and well done. So you can see here, listeners, أكرمك الله. He is definitely praising his own work, but this is not empty praise. He can actually. Walk the walk, and not just talk the talk. This is confidence, and in these three examples that we have given, it is there. The purpose of all of this is to make people follow you because you have knowledge and you are trustworthy. You have the credentials. This is not being arrogant. And thirdly, you can be boastful in order to encourage people to do righteousness. In the same way, you're allowed to do a righteous action in order for others to see you, not so that they may praise you, but that they may imitate you in a righteous action. A good example would be to give charity openly, so that others see you and follow you in this action. Now, what is haram in all of this is to score ego points, to try to show yourself to be better than others, just for your own ego, or to try to acquire the praise of people. No, this is haram. But Even this could be halal in a wartime situation, so you can actually act proudly and arrogantly in front of the enemy, as Abu Dajana radiAllahu an did when he walked in an arrogant fashion, and the Prophet said that this type of arrogant walking is haram, except in this place, meaning the battlefield. قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون. Say with the grace of Allah and His blessings, let them rejoice in that. It is better than all that they amass, meaning of wealth. And the Sheikh goes on to say about this Deen of Islam, وَهُوَ بَيْنَ الْغُلُوِّ وَالْتَقْصِيرِ And it is between going to extremes and between falling short of your duties. وَبَيْنَ التَّشْبِيهِ وَالْتَعْضِيلِ And it is between resembling Allah to His creation and between depriving Allah of His characteristics. وَبَيْنَ الْجَبَرِ وَالْقَذَرِ And it is between saying that people are forced into doing what they are doing without any free will, and saying on the other end that Allah did not create the actions of the servant, but the servant creates his own destiny. وبين الأمن والياس. And it is between feeling safe and feeling in despair. Okay, let us take a few review questions. Question number one: Why did Allah Jalla wa Ala prevent the jinn from overhearing the decree? When the Quran started to be revealed, question number two: What's the ruling on going to soothsayers? Give the different categories. Question number three: We divided Islam up into three categories, and then up into another two different categories. Recall them.